Hey, Wes. Hello. <laughs> I thought, you know what? That's the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. I mean, I was bouncing in my seat. It's got a great name, name too. It's called the F-Up theme. You know, the F-Up theme. It's, it's that describes what we're doing here. Yeah, so we thought, um, let's get meta for a little bit, and uh, we'd do a little Wes and Chris reacts. This is something the YouTubers do. Now we're bringing it to the podcast medium. But what are we reacting to? Ourselves. This is, that's the thing. Oh. You know, like old clips of yourself and stuff. But I hate me. Oh, my God. Oh my god, you should hear old me. It's so bad. So bad. So I thought I thought we'd kick it off with like a really bad one of me. So we go back in time to episode one hundred of oh, Linux Unplugged. Far back. Your first episode. What is this, like twenty fifteen? Episode one hundred. Right on the number. Like you just that's a pretty I, I mean, of course it was because of a special event that you were there. That's pretty cool. That anyways, so, but this is me, um, this is me back then doing the introduction. You know, for episode 100, I wanted to do a meetup, but we have so much going on. We've just done a bunch of meetups, and we have a couple of coming up. Kind of didn't really fit in the schedule, so why not just have people over to the studio and do a little cookout? We had six people RSVP, and we had a pool going. I said three would show up. I nailed it. Uh, that wasn't sped up. <laughs> that was going to be my question. No, nope, it wasn't. You I... can tell because it's it's like a little brighter. You've got a got this weird eagerness sort of yeah. going forward. I was young, foolish. Um, we were having like a big day. Like it was a, that was what, for 100. 100. Yeah, we were doing the old barbecue. For so, what started as like a just sort of a spin-off from last. Yeah. Yeah, in episode 99, which would only have been one week before, I said anybody in the Pacific Northwest that wants to come up and uh, do a barbecue for episode 100, come on up. And uh, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, this would be a great way to find a new co-host for the show. Like, wouldn't that just work out great? And then I thought, yeah, nah, nah, that's probably crazy. So we eat. Do you remember what you brought something good? I can't remember now. I don't know what I brought. I know, I, know, I, know, I mean, I know I brought beer. Yeah. I, you might have bought, you may have, may have been beer brats too. Something that would that's, be my style. Yeah, something that stuck out. And so then after we ate, we all came into the studio, and uh, we did a show, and it was pretty clear, like, right there, uh, with no prep, you were sort of like a Natch co-host, uh, check out, uh, like, we're just sitting here shucking and jiving, and you jump right in. I think that's one of the best things about Unplugged, is you can connect developers with the people who are actually using them. Yeah, they come into the room. Yeah. I like that. Right there. <laughs> Look at me. Go. Right on point. Your first time on air. Like uh, like we had almost planned like that kind of thing. Had, had you done a podcast before? I had not. Really? No. <laughs> well, you were quick on your feet. Um, man. So, okay. So that was for episode 100 and uh, we just finished recording. 314. Yeah. 314. Wow. Yeah. I did some digging around and there's like a big change from like uh from about 100 to 200 i mean i much i much prefer the way it sounds now we've you know we've we've changed it's, quite a bit there it's, it's come a long way so why don't we go back in time you so that was a couple of clips i pulled you pulled a couple of clips and um hmm, i don't know exactly what this one's about it just says gnome crashes and we are back so gnome just crashed on us uh, that's kind of ironic i'm not joking summary um, of the show folks <laughs> this is a this is a bit of an awkward thing for me right now. This is my love song to Gnome because I think it's such a great desktop and I think it has such a strong future and yet I think I'm switching away. And I'm going to be talking about that more, but I just I want to continue being positive about Gnome, but I do have to acknowledge that we just had to stop broadcast and we had to stop and re-edit here and all of that because Gnome crashed on us again. Oh man. I know that what I'm really struggling with is I am very upset, but I right. also am trying to be more positive because I know people work really hard on this. And the rest of the show, you're like, oh, man, it's fine. It's getting there. It's really come a long way. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to be positive because like, I'm, my, new, my, my new outlook on this kind of thing is it just doesn't work for me, but it could be great for other people. That's my outlook now. Very accepting view. And so here I am like in the middle of a crash during a live show. And what used to happen back then is... And it's the most awkward thing for me. It's the thing I hate the most is when Gnome Shell would go, it would take out Pulse Audio, which would leave dead air on the stream. Just nothing. And for like 30 to 40 seconds, oh. it's just dead air. Or sometimes we'd switch to Barry White mode where we'd, 
it would shift us and we'd be in the wrong uh, like phase. And for me as a broadcaster doing a live event, like that's the whole thing you're focusing on. <laughs> it's just, it was like the Achilles heel of a crash and nothing you did, right? No. You set it all up perfectly. It was rough. And I was trying in this moment to stay very positive. So we are going down a path, but, uh, and this is a system, by the way, the one that crashes the most is the system with almost no extensions. Just for the record, the only extension it has is uh, dash to dock and uh, the ping extension. Uh, yikes. So there you have it. Yeah. Yeah. It's good times. It's good times. Do any other machines suffer from this in the studio? Um, we have three GNOME desktops that crash every day. They're all similar hardware. NVIDIA, wow. Arch, Core i7, like a generation ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's happening quite a bit. That's kind of... Well, I had forgotten how bad it got. Oh, it was pretty bad towards the end. Now, we have some issues right now. So I thought it would just be interesting to sort of reflect on where we've been and where hmm. we're going. Boy, I'd say the issues we have now pale in comparison yeah, it's to so that. much more stable. And so the, these systems have been installed for a year and a half. And the main issue we're really having probably results from switching from plasma we jumped on the recording computer from Plasma to XFCE because we were having video artifact issues that we thought might have just been a combination of NVIDIA driver and KWIN or something. Right. However, weird video artifact issues have continued even oh, on... they remain. Yeah. So we think it's just time to do a reload and uh, re-swap a video card out and just do a general work. Um, but this system actually, like the OBS machine, which was the one that was crashing... Which is not, we're not really having problems with it as long as we restart about once a week. Yeah. Right once up. we started using Jack, we had to restart once a week. And, but that's you know, acceptable. We, we do some security updates, we reboot. Otherwise, you're right. It, it just works. You kind of set it, forget it, which is exactly how I want it. That's acceptable to me. You're right, though. I had forgot about that. Do you remember, uh, it, we've had a conversation in a couple of forums over, over the years, but. Do you remember the conversation around submitting bugs when you're doing testing and all of that? That's something we've talked about, like when we're reviewing a distro. I mean, we all love to complain, right? But <laughs> we, we don't all often submit bugs about things we're complaining about. Going back to Poby's argument about filing a bug, this is not one I think, um, and I don't know, maybe it's my bias. I've been around for a while. This is not one I think is worth my time. Uh, because it, <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard for six months from the people complaining about wireless on sixteen oh four. I disagree with that. That I didn't actually have that problem. But oh that my god, that would have been one that would have been. But that's exactly the problem. Like, not everyone had this problem. There were people like very close to you ranting about how wireless on sixteen oh four was completely busted and everyone should avoid it on two sixteen oh four. It turns out, no, it's not busted for everyone. It's not busted for anyone in Canonical. It's only busted for certain select people with certain chipsets in certain environments. That's crazy. But those uh, fuckers wouldn't tell us <laughs> what the details of that system was. Yeah. If you don't tell us, we can't fucking fix it. I think this is a real problem. I think the core problem that that issue, the, the, the thing is, is I'm not going to spend my time I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to, like I said, if I'm working 65 hours this week, I'm not going to work 67 hours so that way I can report a bug and then watch them tell me it's an NVIDIA problem. The thing thing that I would articulate or attempt to articulate now that I wasn't because I was so surprised by how fired up Popey got that I wasn't really articulating very well is the core, I, I was trying to play the part of this is how people feel. Right. Not I, Chris, am not going to file a bug, but people who are working 65 hours a week aren't going to work an extra two hours for Canonical, who maybe they barely even like to begin with, to help out with something like this that should be caught in basic Q&A. And I wasn't trying to say I don't ever want to submit bugs, but I was just trying to – I guess I was trying to have a conversation around how do you solve that problem because – that's like you're not arguing issue. for that position. It just it's a human how problem. people feel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so um, uh, I don't think I did a very good job there listening back to that. And I don't know that too much has changed, right? I mean, oh. maybe it's a little easier. GitHub is popular. PRs are okay. But it, it's still a lot of hoops. I think we as a team are uh, – we participate more in funding open source projects, bug tracking, um, 
issues that uh, you know we or we'll follow issues on githubs for projects that uh, we are are using actively in production so we have improved our skills there mostly because we now have a team that has a culture of doing it but i, I think if you don't have that and you don't have a strong motivator to to improve uh canonicals uh you know or a uh, product you're not likely to do it and I, you're right I don't i don't think it's changed well it's us. it's a culture issue you're right i mean that's exactly it. I, I think the only way you could change it would be, I don't know, a, a lot of evangelism and tooling to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. So you're right. We are on the uh, precipice tomorrow. We're reloading the studio machines. Uh, but but one machine stands alone now in the studio, and that's uh, West Payne's ThinkPad. Uh, so let's one more plasma thing. And I wanted to I wanted to pick up from where we left off last week with you. So during the show last week, you switched over to the Plasma desktop for oh, a little that's bit. that's right. And we've also got the state of Plasma that was posted um, at netrunner, netrunner-mag.com, which we'll have linked in the uh, show notes. So I, I kind of wanted to go over your experience, cover his experience, because I've been, I've, been, I've been so impressed with the Plasma desktop, specifically 5.9, that um, I've had a hard time articulating what's wrong with it. People have said, so what's not working still? And I'm having a hard time articulating it because I'm I'm not like in review mode. I'm just like in use mode. I'm like I'm in just right. like geek out mode. And so I haven't really had to turn on that part of my brain until I started really getting this question more and more. And so now I've slipped into more review mode of the Plasma desktop. And so I've, I've got some observations of things that I think should be improved. Um, but there's still not major things. And so right. I'm curious to hear what your experience has been so far. I've been pretty pla- impressed. I think it's been – a year or two since I really had like Plasma KD anything as my main desktop. Some things I like, like I already use Quassel and other other cute applications, so it was nice to kind of have that be my native environment. But I have been approaching it very much like what you said, just install and the defaults work. I was kind of interested in ex- exploring with that because that's really what I do a lot of the time with GNOME, at least on like this laptop, which we refresh for the show a lot, that kind of thing. So I so I really just kind of installed KDE start or Plasma started working with it. It took me a while to like get used to some of the trivial things, just like the uh, like the mouse cursor is a little bit different. Plus, some of the applications <laughs> I use, like I have a lot of like Telegram or Slack, yeah. they didn't integrate quite as nicely or look quite as nice with with really? just the default theme as I really? found that they did with oh, GNOME. Really, uh, but okay. I have not I have not customized that much. So I'm kind of interested to hear. Uh, so another part that I I like I've been uni- using Unity at work. Mostly just because I got my desktop refreshed there. I haven't taken the time to customize that either because, you know, get work done. Uh, but I have been thinking about either installing GNOME or Plasma. So now Plasma's ah. on the list. Ah. But, like, one of the things I think Unity does well is imitate a tiling desktop or give me some of those features. A lot of the times, really what I want, and Cinnamon does this well, is just like quadrants. Even just splitting half their screens, but especially quadrants. So now you're still on Plasma. Um, so that was back in 2017. Oh, boy. Could you, could you pull up like uh, something there to tell you what version of Plasma you're on. There's probably something in the system preferences. So you're still on it. You really uh, stuck with it. KDE, KDE Neon 516 at the moment. Does that happen to say which version of Plasma desktop? Because you were in that clip, it was 5.9. Yeah, that's the same KDE Plasma version 5.16.4. Hmm. So 2017, wow. That's like, uh, that's you're like, that's the longest running. No, I, nobody else has been stick, stuck to one desktop that long. Yet. Well, so it wasn't that long. There was a long gnome period in between, oh, I have was? to admit. So oh, that's okay. what's funny about this, because this was kind of the... I said it had been like one or two years, but that was just like, I think, trying a desktop that came with KDE as part of an other OS review. Mm-hmm. That is kind of the first time I did like a real, I'm going to use Plasma for a while, at least mm-hmm. the modern version of mm-hmm. Plasma. Mm-hmm. But it still feels just shallow in comparison to what I've been doing now. Huh. Although, I feel like change is in the wind. You guys, I, you're just selling me on Fedora on this this ThinkPad. And you're right, like, I have an ancient kernel. We've been playing with Jack. Like, I'm not too worried about compatibility issues. So, I don't, I'm loving Plasma. I still don't know that I take full advantage of the configurability. And honestly, part of the reason it's lasted so well and, like, I don't have the same complaints is because you tuned this for me when it when it got set up, so it's not it's not really the default. Mm. Have you ever experimented with the uh, with the tiling or the quadrant stuff? Yeah, a little bit. Um, Kwin's great. I could probably be doing a better job of taking advantage of it. <laughs> 
Yeah, K Wind is really great. I mean, you I do, do have now, wobbly windows. I have wobbly windows, and did, did, exploding did, windows are still did, in effect. Did, did yeah. You? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just do this and you go. Pew. Yeah. No, I, I I totally understand. I was just looking over here at my XFCE desktop, going, "Is it worth trying to retrofit this thing with Compiz? No, no, leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. We don't need Compiz. I mean. Unless Compass fixes our weird glitches, yeah. then okay. No, you're right. We don't. It's just, wouldn't it be cool if the windows exploded? It would be cool. So one extra clip. This isn't Linux Unplugged, but uh, Wes and I, back in the day, did TechSnap together. And this is funny because it's a story arc that we did complete on Linux Unplugged later on. We ended up replacing this install. Um, but we we did it initially on the TechSnap program. And then finish the job with uh, by replacing it with Fedora later on, on Linux Unplugged. <laughs> Amazing. After a few years of basically working seven days a week, the Jupiter Broadcasting Studio has accumulated a bit of technical debt here and there. And we've been kind of going through and cleaning it up, trying to address it. But there's one that we've been putting off because it's just worked. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, is always the saying. And this thing is essentially not broke, but... The reality is we have a very old free NAS mini. When IX first started selling the product, I bought one, and it's even running, or it was running, a beta version of free NAS. And we just went to the races and never really went back and addressed it. It's been in production all these years. Yeah. And really, it's it's one of those things that once it's in production, you have a hard time stopping everything and taking this thing offline and interrupting everybody's workflow and upgrading Right, it's pretty essential to the day-to-day operations of... Oh, yeah. We can't put shows out, we can't do no. anything. No, it's so it's kind of a key thing. And, and the other issue is that it's growing so rapidly that uh, we're having a hard time backing it up because you can't really back it up online because we need the connection for other things and it would just dominate our connection constantly. And I haven't gotten... Dan almost convinced me, but I haven't yet gotten like a tape system, which is kind of where I'm actually going with <laughs> Okay, before we get to the backup thing... I said something in that clip that I wanted to follow up with you now that we have our new system, which is based on Fedora, everything's in containers, ZFS for the storage. The one thing I said in there is you really don't want to have to take this thing down for a long period of time and interrupt everybody's workflow. And now the team more than ever is going to rely on services on these things, especially the ones. Ain't that true. Do you feel like we solved that problem? Uh, Maybe not completely, but I think we're a lot, we're a lot closer if only because we understand the system a lot better. One thing that we definitely are doing differently is we won't be taking the next cloud system down to upgrade the storage ever in its current configuration. So in the past, we'd have limited sets of disks. Mm, yeah, we have a lot more expandability now. We'd have to swap in a drive like an animal when we wanted new storage. But this time around with our Team NextCloud instance, we decided to use DigitalOcean Spaces as the back end. So in theory, it'll just grow. Well, in theory, it grew 50 gigs in usage oh, yeah, yesterday. Can, I, I guess I'll go, I'll go check. That now, would be it hasn't been super. It's not completely smooth, I'll admit, but that's a huge advantage. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess it hasn't been super smooth, but the, it, it seems like a, the goal. Okay, actually, no, you're, I'm, I'm wrong. It's been very smooth. There are a few minor Small issues. things. Yeah. And the goal, theoretically, not having to... Um, Swap in new disks every time we have like a new project that we take on. Boy, that that could be a game you changer. To, you just don't have to care what anyone else does. And then because the applications are all in containers, it does really reduce the downtime of the application services because we're upgrading the OS, but the containers remain up. And when we upgrade the containers, we generally it's just a quick take them down. Yeah, we just pull and stop the old one, start the new one. Yeah, should we continue? Yes. We need the connection for other things, and it would just dominate our connection constantly. And I haven't gotten, Dan almost convinced me, but I haven't yet gotten like a tape system, which is kind of where I'm actually going with this. Oh, yeah. But I haven't gotten there yet. If I could find a good deal on eBay, I might get a tape system for it, though. But I haven't, I haven't yet. And so it's in production. We're using it seven days a week, and I don't have the best backup. It's in a raid, but I don't have, a, I don't have, I'm working on that. So, so. it's time for some tender, loving care. We decided we needed to get this thing upgraded because the next step we have to do is address our storage, get our pool back in the right shape, and get backups working. This is this is we're going through the dependency tree to get this thing to a state where it needs to be a reliable piece of enterprise equipment again, and digging it out of its hole. And step one is getting it off of a beta release of FreeNAS, <laughs> so that way we could get it on a supported version of FreeNAS that was getting maintenance that had full features, and then we use that to readdress the storage. 
But in the meantime, we got to get there. And we thought, well, how would the audience do it? Would they make a leap? Would they try to upgrade in between? Would, what would you do? And so what we thought is, let's go out there. We'll, we'll, we'll go out in the Jupiter Broadcasting Data Center, a.k.a. our garage, and we'll just record the whole process and share with you how it went so you can learn from our mistakes or potentially our victory. So we've been looking at this. We have two options. We can either go straight to FreeNAS 11 or we can go to 9.3 and then try to go from 9.3 to 11. What version are we on now? 9.1. Uh, okay. Beta. Right. And so we thought the, the audience would be most likely to do the graphical update options. So we're going to try that. So we've downloaded the 9.3 image. I'll go over and log in and give it a go. Oh, yep. You ready? Should be nothing should have a break. It'll be fine. <laughs> you can hear the old server. It's so, so much smaller. It's no so much kidding. more low scale. Yeah. Uh, this was a fun upgrade because uh, we had really were kind of out. We... It, both of us have managed servers for a long time. The basic storage server is not that, not that complicated. But both of us just sort of felt out of our element with FreeNAS. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I've used FreeBSD. I've used ZFS. I've used ZFS on FreeBSD, but never FreeNAS. Yeah, that's the other thing here, right? This is a, I mean, it's not like we, we're not going to break it, but it's not a test system. So yeah. we would prefer to have the FreeNAS working at the yeah. end of the day. I mean, it's so out of date because it was one of the very first FreeNAS minis and it was a beta build and... We just never. It just, Turns out you're running a podcast network. It just went. And, it went to work, and yeah. we never. We never. Uh, it's a testament it. to the reliability. Yeah, but it's now as we get to the point where we want to do a bunch of storage changes, we got to get this thing updated. So now we might want to do the save config option. Right. Also, yes. I did recommend that. Yeah, we will. Yeah. So you can click here; it'll download your configuration, which oh, is good. Perfect. And uh, so that's step one, and then step two is you have to choose your upgrade image, which is different than their regular. ISO image if you're in the 9 series and you're upgrading. Right. So that's something to keep They've got like an XZ-packed tar that you can just yeah. do. It doesn't have all the ISO stuff. Yeah, exactly. Okay. We've got it selected. Gonna hit upload. A whopping 364 megs okay. of FreeNAS goodness. So I guess this is there's no step after this. You just hit apply update. Alright, let's hit it. It's uploading the firmware. It's going pretty fast. Okay, hey. 30%, 60%, 80, 90. It's uploaded. I think it's probably doing the checksum now. And extracting the firmware. The FreeNAS Mini is in this. We're in the we're in the uh, garage of the studio, and it's out here. So we're sitting next to. We can start to hear it. Start thinking here in a second. Oh, this is it. Extracting firmware. I do feel like the nine one to nine three. That's not a significant jump. I feel like if we can get the nine three pretty safely, we don't lose our configs. It should be a pretty straightforward process. So we're like a standard place. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people probably upgraded from nine three to eleven. So yeah. And then, then it's storage time. Then we're redoing the entire storage setup, Ooh. adding a whole bunch more storage. Excellent. Yeah, I so. think it needs it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're at we're. I shouldn't even say it, but we're at ninety four percent capacity Ooh. right now, which is we got to no change file it. File system loves that. No, we got to get that down to like eighty percent max, uh, which is that's a future goal. But that's why we need more storage. All right. Well, the firmware updates. I'll get our etcher backup just in case this image based upgrade. They call it the graphical upgrade. Doesn't work. We have a backup plan, which is to go to straight to FreeNAS 11 via the ISO image and just plug we're in the USB port. And, try it. Yeah. Although, if we have to plug in the USB port, we're also going to have to get a monitor and a keyboard. <laughs> oh, system is rebooting. Oh, oh, here we go, Wes. Okay, fingers here. crossed. Oh, boy. Now you just wait. When you're doing these things remotely, you just wait for the system to come back up online. And you're, like, you're always tempted to like bring up a terminal window and start a ping. You know, just run a ping. Yeah, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Why not? <clears throat> Should I? Okay, yeah, I sure. will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you just want to know, right? Yeah, resist. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. You know what's interesting is uh, that helped us get in the position to then move over to that super micro box, which then it, uh, really set us up to swap out the whole thing again to Fedora. <laughs> but like that was the crucial piece: is we needed to get the OS normalized. And we had to get more storage. Right. But then we brought it over to a more general purpose system. And Slot eventually. Distant. Yeah. Added more storage. And eventually, I mean, a Linux upgrade. That was one of those, that was one of those upgrades that took a really long time because uh, it was uh, when we were still an independent company on a very, very small budget. So I bought the drives on a Black Friday sale. Right. And they sat in storage here at the studio for a while. Then when I finally got a great deal from Unix Surplus, I got a great machine. I got that in here. And then a listener of TechSnap very kindly donated some memory. That was amazing. 
and really put it over the top, and then we were set. And it was just, it all kind of just eventually came together over like a six month period. I love that that same data set just keeps chugging away. <laughs> yeah, really, really. I, it's really being put to the test right now because it's so freaking hot out there. So if it survives the summer in that garage, I'll be really impressed. It's the ultimate test. It's a pressure cooker. Pressure cooker. 